Hi and welcome to Physio Tutors podcast episode 53 with Adam Dobson. Adam is a physiotherapist from the UK specializing in low back pain. He's quite active on Twitter and an esteemed guest on various podcasts. His special interest is lumbar radicular syndromes, which is the topic of today. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the podcast. Great to talk to you. Hello there, Kai. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Yeah, it's an honor. Oh, uh, Adam, much. we have so many topics and, uh, and uh, I think I'll, I'll just uh, start. So maybe to start with, could you maybe give us a definition of yep. lumbar radicular syndrome so that our listeners know what we're talking about? Yeah. So, yeah, the term syndromes it, it's uh it's had a bit of a bashing recently hasn't it uh the patella pain community have dropped it from uh patella pain now they call it so uh in this case it refers to a group of lumbar nerve root conditions with similar etiologies so it's kind of an umbrella term so uh what we mean specifically is radicular pain, both nociceptive and neuropathic. Radiculopathy, which is technically a loss of nerve functions. So that might be motor, reflex, sensory. Um, it could also refer to the radicular claudication type disorders. So that could refer to pain or sensory, otherwise known as lumbar spinal stenosis. Um, and a various kind of gain of functions uh, that people have, pins and needles, running water, um, creepy crawlies. So it's a kind of like a spectrum of, of symptoms that, that you could have. Radicular pain and radiculopathy are otherwise known as sciatica. If they occur together, we would refer to it as a painful mm. radiculopathy. Claudicant symptoms tend to be described in terms of their anatomical associations. That's your lumbar spinal stenosis, which is interesting because you don't do that with sciatica okay we're, we're referring to the symptoms rather than the potential anatomical causes which i think is is right actually i don't think we should be referring to it from an anatomical perspective because of all the potential for asymptomatic uh kind of uh presentation mris or whatever so these might be better described as phenotypes um, and you'll see no. that in the literature, that these are particular phenotypes, often with mixed presentations. Thank you. And, and, and so what signs and symptoms do we have to look for in a patient suspected to have lumbar radicular syndrome? So yeah, for sciatica, probably directed to the paper by Steins. So I, I direct your listenership to that Steins paper. So what they did is they developed a simple scoring tool based on two reference standards. So it's a nice starting point. So pain below the knee, uh, leg pain that is worse than back pain, um, a report of pins and needles or numbness in the leg, and then the additional criteria was quantifiable motor sensory or reflex loss. Now within that, we want to be considering the context so did the leg pain and the back pain come on together? Um, the, um, in terms of radiculopathy, we'd be thinking about how confident we are in those findings. So you yourself have presented some of the, the kind of reliability papers on radiculopathy and into themselves, these individual findings are not particularly that useful. Um, Oh. So we want to consider the totality of information and the confidence in which we ascribe to that information. So more profound weakness is going to be more uh, convincing than than um, potential pain inhibition, for instance. So we've got that oh. criteria, then we want to be considering the context. Um, in terms of... Uh, lumbar claudication uh, the, there's a paper by Genevieve in 2018 uh, if your patient's over 60 if they've got pain in both their legs uh, if it's relieved with sitting down or leaning forwards um, and we don't think there is importantly a vascular component that we can maybe talk about 
then we may be considering yeah. um, lumbar claudication. So I think we need to consider the age. Just say the average age of sciatica is about 40. Um, but you can have sciatica at any age. I see patients who are 80, and I see patients who are mm. 25. So uh, the age wouldn't be a particular um, kind of indicator there, but certainly with the claudicant patients, they tend to be older. So patients over the age of 60 uh, would be a bit of an indicator. Although uh, um, I do occasionally see patients in their 30s and 40s with claudicant symptoms, so um, it's not a complete uh, um, red line. Yeah. Yeah, my dad was pretty early with uh, uh, claudication as well. So I think uh, before his 50s. Uh, yeah, had, uh, yeah, certainly. Number spinal stenosis, actually. They're a bit so, arbitrary, uh, <laughs> these, these numbers, aren't they? Yeah. And uh, if, if we look at red flags, uh, I think a couple of things uh, come to mind, like uh, a cauda equina syndrome or also vascular uh, pathologies. Could you talk to yeah. us about that? So uh, there's a nice paper by Finucane. I'm, I'm sure that you, you've you've come across that. So um, and it's a, a paper looking at spinal red flags. Um, so we definitely need to be screening with all patients with leg pain. I would say for Coroquina syndrome. Um, I think we should be. Uh, I probably wouldn't go into that in any detail today with Coroquina syndrome, but I'd recommend Tom Jessen's book. Um, the, there's also yeah. a pathway uh, in England that's about to drop in the next couple of weeks. So um, a cordoquina okay. pathway, which obviously is going to only relate to England, but but it might be helpful uh, to think about how we're managing urgent and emergency cases. Um, in terms of uh, radiculopathy, our red lines are the three Ps. Okay. So progressive motor, um, focal motor weakness, progressive motor weakness, or profound motor weakness. Okay, definitely weight, motor weakness over sensory changes. So if they've got any of those things under three on the Oxford scale, we want to be uh, moving these people on, don't we? We want to be... Uh, uh, no. consider not holding on to those people. So that's my kind of red lines when it comes to radicular syndromes. Now, I work in a, a specialist clinic, so these are actually people who are coming to me. Um, so, But if I was working in primary care or on the high street uh, and a patient has one of the three Ps, um, we need to just move them on to a specialist clinic uh, as soon as possible. Um, so I would consider that a red flag. Uh, some wouldn't, but I would yeah. say like a foot drop is a red flag to me. Um, uh, that's profound, isn't it? So that's profound weakness with dorsiflexion. Yeah. Beyond that, um, if they've got a history of cancer, uh, we're suspecting uh, uh, metastatic, metastatic cord compression and they've got leg pain, then we, we need to be moving those people up the chain. Um, just to say 60% of all people with back pain will have some degree of leg pain, which is interesting. Most of that won't be sciatic or actually ridiculous symptoms. But if they've got a history of previous history of cancer, uh, breast, lung, prostate, um, they've lost weight, we're concerned that there may be a, um, a serious pathology, then we not to hold on to them either. Now, interestingly, there's, there's an additional yeah. one, um, which is popliteal artery contractment syndrome. Have you heard of that? Yeah, I mean, I listened to the podcast with you and Tom, so uh, yeah. that, that's where I heard it for the first time, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, very good. Now, yeah. they might have... So if you think about a younger patient who has claudicating calf pain um, and they don't have back pain, um, they just have squarely unilateral calf pain and it's worse with exertion. So uh, mm. usually things like swimming, running, um, fast walking, but it could be cycling. 
uh, as they move into like terminal knee extension. If you've got a patient like that, um, you might consider they have uh, uh, an entrapment of their popliteal artery. Uh, they could have pins and needles. Uh, and if they've got a dusky white leg, if they've got um, loss of pulses, uh, if you feel able to, you've looked at their ABPI, uh, then you might consider that they have a vascular emergency. And actually, people, you can lose your leg with, with that. Okay. Uh, it's very rare, but I think if you don't consider the possibility of those kinds of things, then you're not going to be considering them. Um, and you you may you you may um, you may do something quite uh, naughty. And that's also unilateral, or, yeah, or, yeah, or bilateral. I, I, the 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 cases that you see, it's largely case studies that that you would see uh, yeah. on this thing, uh, and they tend to be unilateral cases. Uh, if they've got bilateral, you might be thinking. Uh, it's not something that I would rule out, but it'd be it'd be strange to be having a symptomatic uh, artery problem in both knees together. You'd be quite unlucky to have that because uh, this is a problem at the knee, the back of the knee. It's not a problem like at the aorta um, or, or, or anything kind of central. Um, but like it could be like an aneurysm or it could be a, a thrombus, like an occlusion. Or it could yeah. just be a slow uh, kind of um, injury to the artery um, through repetitive load. To these people, it's not safe to exercise. Uh, you would tell them to stop exercising yeah. immediately um, outside of doing the tests. But, um, but if you look at the case studies, yeah, it seems to be uh, kind of unilateral symptoms, which so is ridiculous then, generally. Uh, so it could it could well look like that. Okay, so progressive, uh, yeah, motor yep. loss uh, is one thing. We said cancer uh, in the history. Uh, now we talked about the popliteal artery. Uh, Infections is another one, of course, uh, but it, it's going to be a fairly rare. Like so, in the history with infection, I'd, I'd you know, probably have the scope to go through the the kind of entirety of all of the histories for these things. But uh, it might be a patient yeah. who's an uh, uh, intravenous drug user uh, is is one to think about. And I have seen this a number of times uh, in my clinic. Uh, it might be a person who spent, they've been abroad uh, and they've been in swimming pools and spas and things and they've picked up a bug in the groin uh, and then they've, they, they've come home and not felt very well and they've developed back pain. So uh, yeah. the, it usually is for the urinary tract um, that you'll pick the bug up, but uh, some kind of orifice <laughs> needs to uh, be uh, a bug getting into the system. But uh, discitis um, is is uh, is obviously going to be astronomically disastrous um, if 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 you have that. So uh, certainly, if the suggestion. Patient feverish, unwell. Uh, you may have done bloods. Uh, if you've got any concern about anything like you, just move them, move them to, to urgent care. Uh, I would say. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, we we mentioned the the new pathway that will come out in the or the pathway paper about uh, cord equina, but maybe do you want to talk a, a little bit about it? Like because I know there's uh, red flags and white flags. So um, like when 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 should we uh, refer a patient, or when do we suspect corda equina, and when do we send? Yeah, uh, so the, the new paper is developed by uh, an organisation called GERFT, which is um, a UK conglomerate of uh, health professionals, surgeons, um, physiotherapists, policy makers, uh, and also in conjunction with NHS England. So, uh, so it's going to be a national. Uh, like at least to England, I understand. Um, the interestingly, uh, I don't want to make too much of a plug, but Mike Hutton, who's the lead of GERFT, um, they're doing a podcast. It'll be on Twitter. They're doing a podcast in a, in, a, in a week's time, 
but they'll be actually talking about the pathway at uh, our event, event, the National Spine Network event. That's my plug, um, but that's in the UK. But it is open to any people who see spinal problems. So you could you could come from all the seats if you so wished. But um, yeah. so I'd, I'd probably be reluctant to get into the the nitty gritties of of cardioquina, but just to say. Um, if, if a person has emergent symptoms, so if a person has, uh, I tend to think often about loss of uh, urinary function, loss of bowel function, loss of bladder function. So uh, if someone can't feel when they're going to the toilet, if they um, can't mm. initiate flow, if they're retaining, I don't tend to see it in a serial order. Uh, because if there is sufficient suspicion, uh, I'm not going to say, well, you know, you're too early on uh, and uh, we're not going to we're not going to do anything about it. So uh, but it tends to be certainly with my clinic, emergent symptoms within two to three weeks. So if you've got some urinary, no. urinary urgency, which is actually not a symptom of cord uh, uh like stress incontinence, for instance. Uh, if you've had that for many oh. months, many years, then that is no called requirement syndrome. Um, so the, the the guidelines will be very clear about what we do if we suspect patients beyond two to three weeks. But the 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 kind of the the management of those people in terms of where we direct them will be different to the people that we suspect under two weeks. Um, bladder scans, mm. not particularly helpful um there's evidence to say that um checking your anal tone uh is not particularly helpful um or, or indeed they don't rule out the problem which is great for us because uh i'll never be doing that <laughs> oh we do, do, do that really? all the time no <laughs> huh? no yeah, yeah. felt that one didn't just I? kidding um so <laughs> So yeah, so if they if they suspect it in emergency care because they should be seen in emergency care, then you know it's an urgent MRI right. scan uh, for those patients, and then probably managed with uh, discectomy um, in in an emergency capacity. But uh, no. yeah, it's 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 something that we uh, that I see occasionally, but not every day. I think in we no. feel very confident in what is a true case to worry about. Uh, and I think with a lot of the yeah. hype and, you know, Tom is amazing and his book's amazing, but I think that the worry about litigation and all the hype that it's got has people worrying about all kind of urinary problems and, uh, and maybe our reasoning goes out the window when we're panicking that right. uh, we might miss something or be blamed for something. So um, so we work very closely with the on-call registrars and certainly if someone had symptoms more than three weeks, there would be a question about if they would even accept that patient. So, um, no. so you need to know what your own local services and pathways are because I think that their, their threshold for us to refer probably is lower, or, but we certainly need to be thinking about this with all our patients. With, uh, I I can I do this with all our patients, even back pain patients, but uh, certainly if they have leg pain. Okay, and uh, moving on, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think most lumbar radicular syndromes are due to disc herniations, um, but there can also be other causes, such as what what we already touched upon, lateral or foraminal stenosis of the facet joints, uh, entrapping. The lumbar nerve roots. Uh, how can we distinguish those two? Um, I don't. Uh, is the <laughs> is the is the <laughs> short answer. Um, so uh, you just treat as you find. So if 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 someone has, uh, if I'm confident of a presentation of ridiculous symptoms, um, and I'm considering discussing my thinking with a patient and. We, we may be looking at options, you know, management of any kind. 
um, if they if they have those symptoms, I'd be less worried about if this is central, if this is at the recess, no. or if this is foraminal. I, I don't think that it's that helpful to try and think that precisely. Um, and I'm not sure that no. you can, actually. Um, so I would certainly dis be distinct between claudication pain and radicular pain. But if a patient uh, uh, is guarding one side, and I can examine that, um, uh, if uh, if they're protecting that side or if they have mechanosensitivity sensitivity with whatever, straight leg raise or whatever, those, those are my findings regardless of what an MRI eventually reveals. Uh, ultimately, it's about my overall management. So I would keep a sim. I wouldn't try to be too specific. Like we know that the location of symptoms with pain is not that reliable. We know that people with ridiculous no. pain can have, you can have an L5 uh, nerve root irritation and the map show they have hand pain. Uh, <laughs> go figure. Uh, or they can have pain to the front of the leg as well as to the back of the leg. So I don't try to get too mm. uh, kind of, you know, bogged down on is it uh, unless there is more to weakness, and I think neurologically is probably a little bit more precise uh, in terms of looking at yeah. a level. But from a pain perspective, I'd, I'd be less worried about uh, is it a recess or is it an exit in foraminal. It's only going to really matter. The anatomy only matters if you're going to inject or if you're operating. It's basically the so, same story like with other body regions, right? Like if you rehab the shoulder, uh, does it matter if it's the infraspinatus or the supraspinatus or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it surprises me that uh, that people still do. It surprises me that uh, it, it seems the more that you get into this area of work, that, that many things you just uh, inconsequential or you become a bit more simplistic. Uh, and to focus on the fundamentals more. And I think it just comes with exposure, I guess, that many of the the chaff, like uh, spinal stabilization exercises, they maybe just fall away a little bit. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's what you find, Kai. We po we yeah posted a blog about it like a couple of years ago, I think. We kind of posted it, I think, last week again. And I think where it has a place personally is it they can be low load exercises in rehab uh which some people seem to tolerate well uh but i don't worry too much about yeah. stabilization or not it's just an easy way of loading the spine early on and then i move on so that's that's yeah. basically it yeah as a, as a, a progression through uh loading the body um or for a framework of uh that if they have any kind of relationship with the patient's functions or if this is what's tolerated at that point, I have no yeah. issues with that. But it, I think it's all we're bogged down with all of the uh, supposed direct relationships with segmental stability and, and all of these things. And obviously it's a, a big societal baggage that, mm. that we have, isn't it? So uh, I'd, I'd, I tend to focus more on um, general lumbar mobility, progressive uh, walking no. programs, um, and uh, uh, maybe aerobic program no. like cycling. The, there's a paper out recently showing that uh, the aerobic exercise uh, was um, led to uh, increased healing uh, in in these kind of basic um, sciatica like no. animal studies. So and that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because you're bringing blood to the air; it's anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's the, these these nerves need lots of blood. So um, if they can tolerate sitting on a cycle, uh. um, then. Uh, but but really, uh, taking a step back, the it may be that we just look at what they actually enjoy to do and what they're currently doing. It might be that well, you go into the gym. Let's just keep you at the gym uh, yeah we all, we already jumped to treatment uh -huh. almost uh, yeah. but i had like two more questions for you before we re really yeah, sorry <laughs> before we really that. talk about the uh, details <laughs> of, of of treatment <laughs> um 
I was one. Won- I was wondering what's yeah, your stance on sure. uh, sciatica due to piriformis syndrome, or nowadays called deep gluteal syndrome. Oh, <laughs> blimey! Oh. Uh, so I don't use the term. Uh, I don't think it has much utility, if I'm honest. Um, this might be a controversial take. I know there's certain Absolutely, people who yeah. love it uh, on Twitter. The the research is very young, uh, and it's also very presumptive. I think um, we know that the uh, atypical, ridiculous presentations can mm. look like that. So in a kind of stubby buttock, lower back, thigh pain, tenderness with palpation, uh, mechanosensitivity. sensitivity. Uh, you know, so I think that. I would be more likely to consider that to be um, uh, an atypical, ridiculous presentation than I would be anything related to the sciatic nerve within the buttock. Now, genuine um, sciatic mononeuropathy is actually Mm. very rare. I've never seen one. (laughs) Never seen one. So, uh, So unless you've been shot in the buttock with well, a, a shotgun, uh, unless you're being hit in the buttock at high velocity and you have motor loss within the sciatic nerve distribution, well, um, then then I, I, it wouldn't be something that I, I'd be considering. Now, the other side of that, if they have claudicating pain, for perhaps if they had neurology and they had a normal MRI scan, I think in a, in a rare and exceptional case, you may think, mm, "Should we do a yeah. pelvic MRI?" Um, but but uh, so outside of looking at the hip, which is obviously yeah. a, an important buttock <laughs> differential, um, I would call it non-specific buttock pain and look at um, looking at problems. Uh, I'd be looking at um, pressure relieving technology if they had a lot of sit pain. Um, I would be seeing it like back pain. Uh, to to be honest, I would look at the problems. I certainly wouldn't be tinkering and imaging and trying to make it fit mm. to to what I want it to be because I want to stick an injection in uh, into the buttock. In our service, that kind of that kind of management doesn't exist anywhere. There's there's a reason that these people are not seen in secondary care. Have you noticed that? Like you you don't you don't often see surgeons talking about piriformis syndrome. Um. So so yeah, time will tell, uh, I guess. But I am quite cynical. Yeah, about we that one. we filmed the video. Yeah. Yeah, we filmed it. It's pretty similar, so yeah. I'm I'm kind of relieved you 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 are on the same page. I think we filmed the video like a month ago, and at one point I, th- I think uh, we said, "Is it the thoracic outlet syndrome of the lower limb?" Question mark because that's also a bit. M- maybe you don't yeah. agree on that one, but uh, it's also what we see in a lot of times. Like <laughs> you, you don't know further. You don't know is it is it a peripheral entrapment or is it a cervical radiculopathy? So maybe it's toss. But I think uh, uh, if you send yeah. those people in, they usually turn out to be cervical radiculopathies, and then maybe, maybe in some yeah. some instances, it's it's a peripheral entrapment. And I think it could could be it could be similar yeah, with piriformis as well. Uh, yeah. So so uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm dubious, and I, I'm yet to see a genuine case. Like I'm I'm yet to have. A patient, um, like you maybe come back to me or be referred to me or to see a surgeon or we've got a, like a medical associate who sees some of our second, second hand, like our second opinion cases. I'm yet to see uh, those people like come back and say, we have a legitimate case here. Um, it, it seems to be a little bit confirmation bias, uh, in my opinion. It's like we're looking for that to be a problem you know we, we do a scan and then something kind of fits uh and so therefore we've we've decided to 
to investigate that. So I don't think it's implausible. How can it be that that that, that a, a nerve along its path is is uh, um, damaged or irritated? But I, I I think it's probably rarer than what we think. Okay, uh, thanks, Adam, uh, and 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 happy to hear that you're more or less on the same page with uh, piriformis syndrome as as uh, we are. And uh, yeah, I had that prepared as kind of a bonus question because during our Masters of Manual Therapy, uh, a topic that we covered or that we came across was what they called minor neurogenic dysfunctions. So for example, uh, that was what was used when, when we were talking about adhesions of, for example, the dural sleeve and a nerve root. Can this be a possible reason for low back pain? Is this something that you think about in a patient um, or is this just a construct that someone made up during our masters? Um, okay, so the the outer the annulus of the disc has a nerve supply, doesn't it? So um, so any kind of disc extrusion that disrupts the annulus can certainly um, plausibly be a, a cause of back pain. Um, okay. We also know that, that I mean, the, the the disc material is a foreign body, so we know that that well easily can irritate the nerve root and that dural sac, which uh, which is a nociceptive uh, structure rather than a, yeah. a neural structure. So, um, so with that in ca that being the case, I suppose that there is some plausibility for that kind of uh, relationship. To, to lead to back pain. Uh, with the nerve root involvement, I would still probably expect some degree of limb uh, symptoms. But uh, arguably, if you did like a, a straight leg raise, but you did the ankle differentiation and you could strongly bring on their back pain, the, then you could potentially make a case for there being some degree of either stubby dural uh, pain or or discal pain, and I know that some people will will kind of play that card. I think in in the clinic though, uh, it's a difficult diagnosis, a di difficult thing to manage. The mm. surgeons where we work would be not very inclined to operate on a patient like that. Um, yeah with with only back pain um, and also I think that the imaging often comes after the the epiphany often comes after the fact doesn't it so let's say for whatever reason a patient has an MRI scan um, it's only then retrospectively we're going ah well you know we're trying to make it we're making it fit aren't we uh, retrospectively in the light of an MRI scan rather at the beginning so I think it's a challenge the uh, there was one particular case that I had where I, the I probably wasn't doing straight legs. They had back pain. Uh, I wasn't really looking at neural or or any kind of tugging or any kind of um, you know kind of excursion issue with the nerve root or the the disc interface. Um, the GP had did an MRI MRI scan because she knocked on the door sufficiently. Uh, was not interested in physiotherapy. And she had mm. a massive uh, disc extrusion with a massive nerve root compression. Um, but she had no leg pain. So, w w I mean, what do you do with those patients? Um, so I, I think you've got to be humble in, in not being too forthright uh, in saying it cannot be... Because clearly structure mattered there didn't it you know i think it you know extrusions i think only that. two percent uh of people have disc extrusions um so in retrospect it was a kind of learning experience for me in in my communication and my uh unwavering opinion that uh that a disc um could not be uh the cause of their back pain but no. it, it still, with that information in mind, I, I would still think it'd be a challenge in with the current pathways and 
thinkings that we would operate on that person or not. I think we'd need to use some kind of decision making, shared decision, um, and and maybe have an opinion from a surgeon or a, a conversation if they felt strongly. But uh, but yeah, they're challenging cases. Yeah. And uh, if if we move on uh, now, finally move on towards uh, to to treatment. Um, yeah, what what can we do for those patients? Uh, is it wait and see, uh, or can we do? Do we have a strong role in patients with radicular pain? Yeah. So, ba based on the best data that we have, uh, there's a trial called the Scopic trial in in the UK. Uh, and what they found is that uh, by 12 weeks, about half of those people with a new episode of ridiculous pain, sciatica in this case, um, significantly uh, improved. So many of those mm. patients by 12 weeks, no matter what we did, uh, were were significantly better. Um, at 12 months, it's about 75% with a new case. Um If you look at the evidence for, let's say, we agreed in principle to do an MRI scan, we were looking towards an operation or, or a, an interventional uh, procedure, like a nerve root block, um, there is evidence to say that, that microdiscectomy is helpful if you do it under six months, but yeah. at, at 12 months, uh, they're about the same. So, so it, it doesn't seem to alter the outcome in the end, but it, it it potentially reduces suffering. But there's real risk, isn't there? So, real risk of mm. nerve injury, reoperations, high opioid uses. Uh, there, there's a paper looking at trajectory. So, for a, a real group of people, um, comorbidities, high comorbidities, previous surgery, previous injections. They probably don't do that well uh, with surgery. Nerve root blocks um, have seem to be somewhat helpful, but uh, but we don't really know their full the full benefit. So we don't really know when we're coming in. You're working in a triage clinic. You're working as a physiotherapist. It's hard to know who will get better on their own, who mm. who we should move early. Um, so in the NHS. We use a stepped approach, so uh, we might consider a number of variables that I can get into if you want, but uh, we might look at medicines review, advice and education, that may well come from a physiotherapist, stepping up, it might be supported exercise, uh, and <laughs> we can maybe go through what that looks like, uh, medicines review, advice and education. Then we might step to nerve root block, uh, or step to surgical opinion so there's a couple of variables to consider but that stepped approach seems to be uh no worse than um if you just move people to surgeons very quickly if, yeah. if that makes sense i think we we pretty much have the same approach here in the netherlands so uh, yeah. basically uh at, at 12 week mark is the the mark of wait and see or or like i think that, that's when The GP will mention surgery as an option to maybe speed up recovery. Um, but yeah, most people get better anyways after one year. And uh, yeah, so yeah. I think, I don't know the percentage, but we're, a, a we're small percentage, right. yeah, a, a small percentage yeah. goes on yeah. to, to have surgery in the end. Um, yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm I, I yeah, think, uh, yeah. Go for it. Go, go, yeah. Yeah, I was I was curious uh, because um, okay, so we know it probably doesn't matter in the in the long run, but uh, what do you do uh, like besides advice uh, for a patient with radiculopathy and radicular pain? Is there is there any exercises that you that that generally seem to work well for you? For uh, I'm I'm personally thinking about direction specific exercises, that maybe the McKenzie approach. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what what do you do in the clinic? So that there was a systematic review uh, by Dove that just just published, looking at the effectiveness for, of physiotherapy for sciatica, um, and essentially uh, what it revealed is um, 
there's a conglomerate of um, high biased papers, very poor evidence across all modalities. So, um, so really, uh, we can't. The science doesn't really advocate any particular approach being better than any mm. other different approach. So, arguably, the the guidelines meant to offer advice and education exercise, but the the content of that exercise seems to be whatever your preference is. I, I guess well. uh, <laughs> my my preference is, like we said, is. Uh, initially about considering what you value uh, and what you're currently doing from a advice and education, do-it-yourself perspective, you know, mm. keep at the gym, um, you know, keep walking uh, every day if, if you like walking uh, or no. equally rest. If if your leg pain is, is too intense, you might ask them to ease back. My general preference is towards kind of lumbar exposure, type things and general aerobic exercise if we were to look at a supported exercise regime so cycling um walking uh, and i keep it as simple as that to be honest i don't uh I, I don't make it any more complicated i don't do neural dynamics i don't do preferential like the the, the mckenzie stuff i don't do that mm. I, I think it's okay if you do that um, but- but uh, I, I don't tend to do that. I think you need to keep it really simple and you need to get the, the, the patient on board. So um, whatever the, they can tolerate really yeah. is is what I would be doing. Uh, I've had sciatica myself um, and uh, I, I would walk every day. I had pain with walking, but um, but it wasn't because I was walking. If that makes sense, it was there yeah. if I walked or not. So it wasn't yeah. claudicating as such. It just hurt yeah. all the time. So I was painful walking, but it just gave me something to do every evening and took my mind off it. And I do feel that just by maintaining that, regardless of it being painful, because yeah. um, everything was painful, to be honest, Kat, mm-hmm. um, they, I think that that may have aided my recovery in the end. Now, that is just yeah. mine bias but we need to we need to explain that this is not a quick fix that that this is going to take time and they've got to be patient with it uh my red lines just to say i didn't mention that the three p's um you know that we're we're not going to be going on a walking program if they've got a foot drop uh for instance we're we're going to want to get an opinion on that we probably uh, probably would scan that person uh, no. to be honest and consider differentials um, but uh, yeah I mean what, what's your opinion Kai yeah I feel like uh, yeah based on the evidence that I know of there is no best solution like you mentioned already so I'm, I'm telling advice I think is the most important part and uh, yeah I, I try out different stuff like I do like the McKenzie approach like uh uh, the extension exercise and, and I tell people like, um, you know, try it out if it kind of helps you uh, roll with it. And uh, some people like it, some don't. And uh, yeah, then if if, if if it doesn't feel good for yeah, them. You can certainly then, look then, for some kind of like symptom modification, couldn't you? Yeah, exactly. That That's basically it. And it's the same, I think, with the neurodynamics. Yeah. I usually try to have them avoid uh aggravating the pain a lot so for example if bending over is really pro- provoking then i tell them like don't do it too much uh, it doesn't do any harm but you don't want to poke uh the bear too much so do as much as you can but uh don't overdo it stuff like that i mean yeah it's kind of, it's sometimes i feel it's kind of frustrating we don't have like a a, a really great treatment for them um but yeah i think that's that's just just how it is yeah, just just to go back to the the decision making process as well. Uh, obviously, the time frame six the, the pain's under six to eight weeks. Uh, prognostically, that is is good, isn't it? If if uh, no. if we we see them early, um, if the trend of symptoms is improving, we're going to hold on with that. People, uh, what's your confidence in the diagnosis? 
the the level of disability. You might use like a a Roland Morris. Uh, what's mm -hmm. the patient's preference? What's their fitness for interventional procedures? Um, what's the level of disability? They tend to do less well. Um, and what's their history in terms of surgery for the spine, uh, injections? Those things might prognostically mean they may do less well with a mm. surgical intervention. So when we're trying to keep that that stepped approach, but in light of these variables. So um, so there's no kind of cookie cutter, is there? Uh, that that we should take. We need to consider the patient's individual variables because we don't have any other evidence to guide us otherwise. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm looking at my list of questions, uh, Adam, <laughs> and. Uh, I mean, uh, we, 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 we could talk uh, about so much more, but uh, we're also trying to keep it or to not make the podcast too long. But uh, I wanted to ask you, is there anything that we haven't touched on yet that, that you would really like to talk about? I'm not sure. I think we, we've touched on some important elements. Um, I mean, there, there is a, a body of work looking at like the, the lived experience of people with sciatica. And there's a couple of papers that look at that. Um, they do like the use of models. So making it visual, using a model, um, talking about discs and talking about nerve roots. It's not, it's not, um, it's, it's not a bad idea. I think it's sometimes people feel that we've kind of come to a point where we shouldn't even discuss structure uh, in any way, shape or form. It's like, come on, you failed you because you're talking about discs or something. Uh, so with these patients, I carry around a, a spinal model in my bag. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I like to talk about, I use the model uh, to educate. Um, so even, so let's say we're talking about the, the nature of their leg pain, but equally, if I don't think they've got radicular pain, <coughs> Uh, a combination of an examination and using of the model and saying, look, you know, we're testing these structures and they're all robust and, and sound. So um, so using models, using your, uh, your um, examination, I like to talk people for why, why am I doing the reflexes, oh. why am I doing the straight leg raises, why am I, um, yeah. what does this, t like give the patient a narrative as you're following through things, um, ask what their general preferences are. And then you can use, uh, let's say we're thinking imaging is not going to be helpful or we're not thinking it's a ridiculous problem. You can use um, that that evidence as you've gone through as a counter to support your um, position. And I think that it, it kind of disarms patients particularly those patients who come in with very, very strong opinions on what they think you should be doing mm. um, or what they think they need. So um, so equally, you know, communication about imaging, the utility of imaging, uh, the predictive nature of normal things on scans, uh, models, using the examination. I do this a lot uh, in my clinic. Um, and I, they often have imaging results, so I'll go through them on yeah. the on the on the system as well. And I think it's absolutely okay to do that. I, I do have to want to ask you one last question, though. Uh, with the model, do, do, does your model still have the the old classic herniated disc uh, attached to it? Uh, well, I've I've pulled it off. <laughs> it did because, have, because, and I've, because I've I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm actually looking. I'm actually looking at our model here on the table, and it still has it. And 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 I'm always like, uh, if 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 I talk about structure with those patients, I'm I'm always wondering. Like, uh, I'm looking at the herniated disc, and I'm like, I don't know, should I be using it or not? So uh, yeah, that mine yeah. doesn't have a red sticky thing. I, I, I literally oh, pulled it off, so it's uh, yeah, it's a pretty uh, neutral. Uh, let's have a look. Show me again. Oh yeah, uh, Andre yeah, you, Andreas just pulled it away. He <laughs> wanted to see it again, uh, Andreas. <laughs> yeah, it's like the classical. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, oh, that is nasty looking. That why? Is it yeah, red? yeah, that's why. Well? Yeah. these things yeah, yeah. aren't red, are they? We really? should have removed it long uh -huh. ago. 
<laughs> uh, look at this. Your spine is healthy. This, uh, don't worry about that red thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's not for you, that red thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, just to say, we we uh, we didn't really get into too much on the management of, of radicular claudication uh, stenosis. I've done a few talks on that uh, that you can find on the interwebs. I've done a few podcasts on that. Uh, we kind of focus more on sciatica today, haven't we? That's but true. Uh, uh, they it tends to be that these are more long term conditions, um, and uh, certainly surgical decompression is is. Uh, it kind of considered for the maybe the more disabled patients or or people mm. who uh, they've kind of been through the physiotherapy uh, and actually we've got good evidence now that physiotherapy is really helpful for that group of people and there isn't many things that we can say that for is it that true <laughs> that, that we that. can say the evidence is is so when you compare that to the evidence for sciatica that. um you know. Okay, but 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 yeah, you, you, and now let's say let's add five minutes uh, more because now you just opened the Pandora's box with the treatment for uh, lumbar spinal stenosis. So what, what what would you do in those cases? I mean, I, yeah. I can tell that a lot of people react pretty well to to exercises in flexion. I mean, I I, w I would definitely consider the biking there. But 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 what 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 do you do? What do you do ge in general for those patients? So yeah, so we equally we wanna educate our patients we want to uh, use models um, we want to link that to their their history uh, and kind of make it clear why we may be considering those things we want to use the examination these usually have normal neurology so uh, mm -hmm. plus minus mechanosensitivity although they can be mixed but the general textbook is that they don't have any of those things to keep it simple um, and they often don't actually. So, uh, so we can use that and and demonstrate that. Um, we look at their problems. There's certainly, from a daily perspective, we'd encourage the people to be uh, flexing regularly. Um, yeah. We'd encourage them to lean to get symptomatic relief. I would encourage them to literally lean into leaning. Um, we might look at weight management. Um, towards the kind of supported exercise, cycling programs, aquatic aerobics. Um, yeah. I actually think it's fairly okay if, if tolerated to ease into an extension program, uh, yeah. potentially if they're uh, in, in prone, uh, and just see how they tolerate being in prone. Uh, and then you can potentially uh, ease them into um, uh, increasing extension. I dare say a little bit of manual therapy. But that mm. wouldn't be me doing that. Uh, <laughs> but some people might suggest that to kind of help with extension, hip uh, extension. Uh, yeah, I can't agree. believe I just said that. I'm going to get shut down for saying that. Yeah, I'd say. Uh, I mean, it almost makes for 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 another episode of uh, of a podcast uh, with you. So we, we <laughs> yeah, might, we could we might, quit, uh, everything else. Come here. Yeah. yeah, we might have to get you on uh, for a second time, but. Um, uh, so to finish it off, Adam, uh, yeah. where, where can people find you if uh, if they have lots of questions after this podcast? So uh, I'm on uh, I'm on the socials at Adam Dobson one two three on Twitter. Uh, that's essentially the the best place uh, and the only place really to find me. Uh, so I'm happy to take questions. Um, I'm happy to answer any DMs within reason. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm quite open, uh, and I'm fairly um, busy on on social media, uh, so that'd be the best place to find me. Okay, awesome. So, uh, Adam, I would like to thank you a lot for your time and for your knowledge, and it was a pleasure to to have you. Thank you, Kai. Yeah. So, thanks a lot for listening to this episode, and to access the transcript and additional resources, make sure to sign up for free Physio Tutors membership on physiotutors.com and benefit from more useful physio content. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button or follow our podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and consider leaving a review if you really enjoyed it. And with that being said, this was Kai for Physio Tutors and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.